Hello, my violence loving buddies. This is Depassion, also known as Mikkel. I've been away for a while. Damn, a really long while. Hope you're all staying safe out there. This No More Side Job segment will feature my review as well as my wish list for No More Heroes 2 Desperate Struggle. I have a lot of mixed feelings about No More Heroes 2. This was my first sequel to a game that I was super excited for when it first came out. Having a product as reference to what I prefer and some loosely structured expectations really got my hopes up for this game. However, I will do something a little different initially for this review. I will do what I can to look at No More Heroes 2 on its own first before comparing it to the first game. That way I can show you its own strengths and weaknesses rather than be simply angry that it is not No More Heroes 1, just more and better. Due to the nature of reviews that I have seen in the past when it comes to video game sequels, the following games from a gem end up not getting a decent review because of nostalgia, loss aversion, or high expectations. Appraising a product for what it is is part of the reason why we fell in love with the first game in whatever series you can think of in the first place. Anyway, I'll end my tower of babbling there, now that we are past that half assed disclaimer. <laughs> Same as before, for this review I will go over what I believe to be the good and bad parts of No More Heroes 2, its story, visuals and gameplay. All followed up with my wish list for what I hope carries over into No More Heroes 3. Now let's draw our beams and stand against the madness. Story. Our first cutscene sets the tone for how Santa Destroy has changed, a much rougher place to live in. Assassin fights are more common and Travis found the means to walk away and unfortunately, he has to return. Getting narration from Grandpa Max really sets the tone for the epic tale of craziness and tragedy that is about to begin. The story drops us into a scene with a character whose brother a lot of us could easily miss or forget. Travis doesn't mess around either, and we head straight into the action. Now, I think this cutscene really sets an example for how a fair bit of the story will actually go. Something witty, straight to the point, and fight. A lot of boss interactions are mostly brief or lack a lot of substance. We don't often get to see how two assassins bounce off each other. We do find out that all the assassins are eager to fight Travis. He became a well-known figure in the assassin world. They want to know how Travis got to walk away after rising to the top, and he would do anything to climb back on top. Back on top. Back on top of this dick! Not all of the assassins need to have lengthy interactions, but it helps if at least 8 out of the 15 had meaningful interactions with Travis. However, with Bishop's death setting off this story of revenge, the rest of Travis's actions sort of make sense to a degree. His priorities are different, not on the individual assassins, but the bat bastard at the top. This does not excuse the story for failing to acknowledge this directly, though. Seeing Travis outwardly acknowledge his way of grieving... Everybody deals with grief differently, right? Some people fuck at funerals. I cut off heads. This is a witty line and interesting. Lines up nicely with how some people deal with their frustration by playing video games. Plus, nothing can compete with the rush I feel from watching a person disappear. As this is a story of revenge, going at it as solo as possible does back this up a little bit. I just wish this was pointed out by either Sylvia or Shinobu. We do see how Travis is possessive of his journey up to the top, so he definitely shows that he still takes some honor and pride in what he does. Due to this solo journey, we have supporting characters like Naomi, Diane, Thunder Ryu, Randall, Manny, and Ryan either on the sidelines or forgotten entirely. Bishop's death is initially gripping and a great additional motivator, since this will be a personal journey for Travis. However, Bishop is barely mentioned throughout the game. First thing that came to mind to fill this gap was giving Travis dream sequences in his armchair of him playing a video game with Bishop, building the relationship in front of the player in a suitable way. This would help the player see what Travis actually lost. Sylvia, Shinobu, and Henry interactions are great, each being funny and showing glimpses of how the characters have changed in small ways. Being set in a world where the assassination gig has grown is intriguing. Most of the assassins that appear have a direct interest in Travis because of his previous adventure, and it really shows in some of their dialogue. Such as Nathan, his only reason for gaining the position he did as a cultist was purely to clash swords with Travis. Along with Charlie referring to him as Mr. Mr. Touchdown, Touchdown, and Kimmy being a literal fan of Travis as well. Fortunately, we are reminded why we are in a desperate struggle at the middle point and end. This does hurt the story a bit because with such a strong response to Bishop's death and little follow-up, does make the story seem messy. 
Not much is explained in game about what happened between the first and second game, which does harm the experience a little for fans of the first. Characters such as Thunder Ryu, Diane, and Randall, the latter who died in promotional material, are forgotten about because of this new landscape which Jasper Bat Jr. has built because of his influence on Santa Destroy. A lot of the crummy charm that Santa Destroy had is hollowed out, even the side job businesses take a hit. So oddly in that regard, this game has done its job, making me miss Santa Destroy. That was weird to realise while writing this review. However, with such a gorgeous group of cutscenes and the hard-hitting soundtrack, I can't help but return to this game again and again. We do still get a lot of funny interactions with different characters and assassins, my favourite being Dr. Lex Shade. Devilish laughter. And Glastonbury getting ready to punk. All the sheer badass vibes of Ryuji and Travis not trading words but just battling. Shinobu dissing new Destroy Man and detonating the smug pricks half ass. Capping off Captain Vladimir's voyage, meeting Alice, killing any of the assassins, visiting Bishop's grave, and cruising through Santa Destroy. Despite me opening with my problems with the story, it is still fantastic and a fun time. I hardly skip cutscenes to this day for good reason. The weirdness and punk fantasy that No More Heroes has at its core is still here and fun. Sylvia's hair changing, Henry's dream sequence sending Matt Helm to Matt Hell, and Travis getting laid while his motel is bursting with merch. All of this is somehow in the same story and freaking hilarious once you stop and really smell the guns and roses. We even get a full ecstasy gauge after going down with fucking dog too. May the power of bonus be with you, Travis. Dog! 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 <laughs> well, that's it for the story. Next time I'll be talking about the visuals and some of the tasty gameplay features. See you on the next journey. Take care. Uh...